This lecture will cover tinea saginata, which is also called the beef tapeworm. I'm Dr. Paul Pottinger. The objectives are to understand the life cycle of this worm and therefore how to break the cycle. More importantly, to get you ready to understand tinea solely on the pig tapeworm. That you should learn next. Know who gets the beef tapeworm, be able to make a diagnosis, and of course be familiar with treatment options. Here's our tree of life. We're within the cestode or tapeworm family. And what we see here, as you recall, is Tinea saginata is one of the worms in which humans are the definitive host. And that means that it has a very simple life cycle. Life cycle starts when a human being consumes beef that has cysts in it. Each cyst contains uh, a little protoscolex, the head of a worm that's ready to hatch. If that beef has been cooked, then it's not dangerous. But if the beef is undercooked, if it's rare or raw, then once the cyst is chewed up and makes its way past the stomach, it will in effect hatch in the small intestines, hold on for dear life to the intestinal wall using its four suckers on the scolex, and then begins to grow. Grow and grow and grow until it becomes potentially meters long. Each of those meters is built up with innumerable uh, proglottids. Remember the proglottid has both ovaries and testes. These are self fertilizing hermaphrodites so that by the time a proglottid or even just an egg leaves the stool and hits the deck it has become infectious. Now there's an interesting fact about these proglottids they are highly motile they move around uh, and we think they do this because it's evolutionarily advantageous to do so. What they're trying to do is move away from the pile of human poop and out into open grass because to complete the life cycle they gotta get back into a cow Cows don't eat poop, they eat grass. If a cow does come along and unknowingly hoovers up one of these proglottids or just the eggs that have fallen out of it, the egg will make its way into the GI tract, get across the GI wall of the cow, and set up a new cyst inside the meat of the cow. If that cow is consumed, the life cycle will be complete. So this is a zoonosis. The transmission is beef to mouth, not fecal oral. And as usual, the eggs have to get out of the human body in order for the life cycle to become complete. Now, you have to have cows and people together to get this infection, but not just any cows. They have to be cattle that forage out in the open where humans have no other option and there's poor sanitation. You also need to have failure of the meat inspection system, and you have to have cultural practices in which this meat is not well cooked. This could be steak tartare. Uh, in Ethiopia, they call it kitfo. It goes by many names. I think it probably is very tasty, but unfortunately it also carries a certain amount of risk with it. In fact, there's probably 50 million infections in total worldwide. How does it present? Most people with tinea saginata have no symptoms whatsoever, but sometimes people will pass a proglottid or just a whole long strobilia per rectum. That will get the attention of that individual. Sometimes patients will have diarrhea, belly cramping, or anorexia, a general sense of unwellness. Unfortunately, in spite of what you've heard, this is not a reliable weight loss plan. And although proglottids were sold back in days gone by to help people lose weight, I mean, I suppose if you had a whole bunch of tapeworms, you'd have enough diarrhea that you'd have a malabsorptive syndrome. They don't compete with you for what you're eating. They don't even have a mouth. What they do is just absorb a little bit of the micronutrients from your GI tract. I wish this worked. So how do you make a diagnosis? So have they consumed rare or undercooked beef? And have they passed something per rectum? It might be a single proglottid, about the size of your thumbnail, for example. If it starts wiggling around, you've made your diagnosis. If they pass an entire chain uh, body of these proglottids, have them bring it in in a Ziploc bag and take a look at it to make your diagnosis. If it's just a sense of unwellness and diarrhea, check the poop. Look uh, at your specimen under the microscope. If you see the egg, you know that you've got a patient with tapeworm infection. And once in a while, a gastroenterologist will stick a scope in there to see what's wrong, and, well, there's your problem. Now, most of these patients will not have an elevated eosinophil level. That's because these worms don't really present themselves in any meaningful way to the human gut-associated lymphatic tissue. They just stay in the gut. There is a serology test that's available. Uh, I don't find it to be reliable, and it certainly should not be necessary for routine practice. What do we do? Just like the fish tape worm, we treat, and we treat with praziquantel, short course, very effective. As a public health person, you want to break that cycle. Try to improve sanitation in those communities and try to work with people 
if not to cook their meat, at least to inspect it and to handle it in this sort of sensible fashion. So those are the key concepts for Tinea saginata. This is the beef tapeworm. You get it when you eat undercooked beef. Any place you have humans defecating indiscriminately on the grass and cows coming along to eat them and then having uncooked beef, you can get into trouble. Most people have no symptoms. The worm is well tolerated, but sometimes people get freaked out when they pass a worm or they may have true GI upset. You'll make a diagnosis when you look at the proglottids or the eggs in the stool. We treat with praziquantel, and remember that prevention involves improved sanitation, beef inspections. If you're ever in doubt for your own personal use, cook the meat. Thanks for your attention.